In this example, what we have is a cylindrical capacitor. Just like any capacitor, this uh, consists of two conductors, one of them in the shape of a solid cylinder of radius R1, and the other one is in the shape of a very thin concentric shell of radius R2. It's given that these cylinders has the length of L here. And the question is, if you connect this to a battery so that it has charges Q and minus Q on these conductors, can you determine the capacitance? So in order to determine the capacitance, we are going to make use of the same analytical approach that we used before. So the first step was to place Q and minus Q on the conductors. So what I'm used to is to place the positive Q on the inner uh, conductor. So that's what I'm going to do here. So positive Q will be on the inner conductor and the negative Q will be on the other conductor. But if you, if you were to do it the other way around, since you guys already thought about uh, the question that I asked you guys at the end of the last video, you know that it doesn't really matter which one has the positive charge and which one has the negative charge. So the choice is totally up to you. But this is my preference. So if you want to do it the other way around, you are welcome to do so as well. All right, so we place the charges Q and minus Q. Now, next order of business is to calculate the potential difference. But this has two steps because in order for me to calculate the potential difference or voltage here, I need the electric field, right? So the first uh, thing we should do is to find the electric field in between these uh, conductors. Using Gauss's law, it says E dot T is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. Once we have the electric field, all we have to do is find the potential difference between the two plates or the voltage, which is equal to negative of the integral E dot TL from negatively charged conductors to the positively charged conductors. Once we have this, the last step is, now we have V, we already know what charge is, determine the capacitance, which is going to be Q over V. We are done with step one. We place the charges Q and minus Q on the conductors. Now we need to find the electric field. Let's do that on the next board. Now uh, we are after the electric field between these conductors. And since there's cylindrical symmetry here, uh, we are going to have to use a gas surface that is also a cylinder and which is passing through the space between these two conductors. So this is the gas surface. Let's say this gas surface has the radius of R. And since again, there's cylindrical symmetry here, the electric field lines will be actually perpendicular to the side surface of this cylindrical gas surface. If I were to try to draw them three dimensionally, I guess they are going to look something like this. This is actually coming towards you and as such. So the electric field lines will be perpendicular to this side surface, whereas they will be parallel to this uh, left surface and it will be parallel to the right surface. So there will be no flux to these left and right surfaces, but only on the side surface here. Maybe what I should do is I should label these surfaces. So I'm going to call this surface number one. I'm going to call this one surface number two. And I'm going to call the side surface, surface number three. And by the way, if you cannot picture these electric field lines uh, from my beautiful three dimensional picture, maybe what I should do is I should give you guys a perspective of how it would look from here. So this is how it is going to look like. So this is the inner uh, conductor where the charges on the surface and you will have the negative charges on the outer surface. So all the field lines that start from the positive charges within the inner conductor will end on the negative charges within the outer conductor. And this is our uh, cross-sectional view of the cylindrical gas surface. So the dA vectors are actually 
perpendicular to the side surface here. So if we were to write the, the Gauss's law here, we are going to write E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. Now this integral can be written as sum of three integrals. So you're going to have over the first surface or this uh, left surface E dot dA plus E dot dA through the right surface or flux through the right surface plus flux through the third surface which is our side surface here. This should be equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. We know that there is no flux here through the side surface because on this surface the dA vector is pointing this way, right? So this is the dA vector for the first surface and the field lines are always parallel to this. So it's not going to give you any flux through the surface. The same can be said for the right surface over here, which is also zero. And the only non-zero flux is through our side surface here. Now, since the electric field and the dA vector are always parallel to each other, on the side surface, this integral will simply be through the side surface E times dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. And since the electric field is constant in magnitude, I can take it out. Again, the reasoning is as you move on the surface and if as you look around, you will always see the same charge distribution. So it doesn't matter where you are on the side surface. And since it is the, the charges that are the source of the electric field, if you see no difference on the charge distribution as you move around, guess what? The magnitude of the electric field will be constant. So uh, which is going to give us then E times dA. Now this is basically the area of the side surface over here. Let's say our gas surface has a length of h here. So it's just going to be then 2 pi r times h. And the next question is how much charge do we have within the gas surface? In order to figure out how much charge we have within the gas surface, the very first thing that we need to specify is our charge density. Now, the other uh, cylindrical shell is out of our gas surface, so we don't really have to worry about that. But what we need to worry about is the portion of the inner cylinder that we have within our gas surface. And uh, since it's a conductor, the charge on this conductor will be on the outer surface, meaning we are going to have to use the surface charge density here. So let's define the sigma first, the surface charge density here. The sigma is the total charge of the inner cylinder divided by the total area of it where we can find charge, which is going to be the side surface of this cylinder. So it's just going to be 2 pi r1 times the total length of it. Now that we have this, Q enclosed will be simply equal to sigma times A prime, where A prime is the area that you have within your gas surface on which you have charge, which if I try to draw here would be this guy. And it will have an area of 2 pi r1 times the length of the portion of uh, the inner cylinder we have within our gas surface which is going to be the length of our gas surface here. So if we were to calculate this what we are going to get is by plugging this in here obviously q over 2 pi r1 times l times 2 pi r1 times h and as you can see many of uh, these cancel out. So 2 goes, pi goes, r1 goes, which simply is equal to q over l times h. By the way, as you can see, you could have even used lambda, charge per unit length, since the charge is distributed uniformly over this cylinder. All right, now that we have our q enclosed, we can solve uh, for our electric field here. So I will have e times 2 pi r times h is equal to 
q over l times h over epsilon 0 and the h is cancel out and if we solve this for the electric field we will find the electric field 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 or 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l times i and just like what we did before if we need to write this as a vector we could use r hat where r hat is the unit vector that is radially outward okay so we have our electric field now we can make use of this to calculate the electric potential so the expression that we are going to make use of to calculate the voltage across these capacitors is still the same and since the electric field is along the radial direction, I'm going to choose the DL vector also along the radial direction. So maybe I should just draw it here. So this is the DL vector that I'm going to make use of. And remember, the path doesn't really matter and I want to make it as simple as possible. So I'm going to move along the direction of the electric field. One other reason why you would want to do that is because when you move perpendicular to the electric field the electric potential should not change meaning you can move uh, along this direction you will see no difference in electric potential or you can move along the length of the cylinders between them again since this is perpendicular to the electric field you will see no difference the only difference will be along the radial direction so now that we defined our uh, dl vector let me quickly remind you our electric field what we found the electric field was 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l times r r hat and the dl vector is r hat dr so if i take the scalar product of these two and plug them in here we will find the voltage to be the scalar product is quite simple 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over lr dr now that this is an integral with respect to r the radial distance from the axis of these cylinders uh, where do we go from we go from the outer shell whose radius is r2 and we go to the surface of the inner cylinder whose radius is r one so if we solve this integral maybe what we should do is we should take the constants out so we are going to have one over two pi epsilon zero q over l and in the integral what we have left is from r2 to r1 dr over r now if you take the integral of one over r what you are going to get is the natural logarithm of r ln r so v will be equal to minus 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l uh, ln r from r2 to r1 which is going to be equal to by the way if you want to get rid of this minus sign here the easiest way to do that would be to flip these limits so what we are going to get is 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l ln r from r1 to r2 now so this is going to give us the the potential difference to be 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l ln r2 minus ln r1 this is in parenthesis so this will give us the voltage the potential difference between these two plates 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l ln r2 over r1 so we got our potential difference now the last step is to plug this guy in in the capacitor equation to figure out the capacitance so the capacitor equation tells us that the capacitance is nothing but q over v and let me quickly remind you what we found for the voltage which is given here so if you plug this guy in here what you are going to find capacitance to be is q over 
1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 q over l ln r2 over r1 and the q's will cancel out you can take this 2 pi epsilon 0 l up which is going to give us the capacitance to be 2 pi epsilon 0 l over ln r2 over r1 again if you pay attention to this expression it has only dependence on the geometric aspects of uh, the capacitor as well as this epsilon zero just like the parallel plate capacitor now also what i want to do here is again to take a look at this limit where r1 is almost equal to r2 or i can express it like this i guess r2 minus r1 let's call this d is way smaller than r1 and or r2 so what would be the capacitance in this limit before i determine what capacitance would be i would like to express this r2 over r1 as r2 over r1 is nothing but r1 plus d right that's our r2 divided by r1 which can be expressed as 1 plus d over r1 and since d is very small compared to r1 i guess we can say d over r1 is way smaller than 1. why did i want to do that because i know that ln 1 plus or minus x when x is very very small compared to 1 is roughly equal to plus minus x so if this is 1 plus 0 0.01, then this is going to be 0 0.01. If this is 1 minus 0 0.01, then this is going to be minus 0 0.01. You can actually check this in your calculator. See if this actually gives you the right approximation. So with these in our mind, we can now express uh, C. Maybe I should write in the limit here. After all, this is a special case. The capacitance now will be equal to roughly now i'm going to keep epsilon zero here and i'm going to have two pi times l here two pi times l here and what we are going to have here is ln one plus d over r1 but d over r1 is very small compared to one so i guess ln 1 plus d over r1 will be almost equal to d over r1 so i'm going to write it here d over r1 and you know what this expression will reduce to it's just going to be equal to epsilon 0 2 pi r1 will go up r1 times l divided by d again so remember what d is d is the distance between the conductors right now what about this 2 pi r1 times l here 2 pi r1 times l should also look very familiar to you because this is nothing but the area of uh, the side surface of a cylinder right so since r1 is very close to r2 these are the areas of these cylinders again the capacitance reduced to epsilon zero a over the where a is the areas of these conductors which is the capacitance of capacitance of the parallel plate capacitor parallel plate capacitor but this is only true in this limit let me be uh, clear here okay uh, so with this we are going to conclude this video our next video will be about the parallel and series connected capacitors. Talk to you later.